Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to part three of my special four-part series on the Halloween movie franchise. I'm so excited to be going over Halloween H2O, and even less excited to be going over Halloween Resurrection. Not gonna lie, that movie is not on my list of awesome Halloween movies, and I consider it the worst of all time, so this is gonna be an interesting episode, that's for sure. So thanks again for tuning in, I appreciate it. So diving into this episode, we're gonna be talking about Halloween H2O, and Halloween Resurrection. Halloween H2O is a direct sequel of Halloween 2, so it completely retcons Halloween 4, 5, and 6, 100%. Halloween Resurrection is a direct sequel to Halloween H2O. So the timeline for these movies would follow Halloween 1 from 1978, then Halloween 2, and then you're going to jump and watch Halloween H2O and Halloween Resurrection. So that's what's called the H2O timeline, the H20 timeline. So Halloween 20 years later. That's, that's really how they taglined the H2O movie. And in my opinion, it's totally phenomenal. I, I love Halloween H2O. It was one of the first Halloween movies I ever saw. And still to this day, I put it as one of the top Halloween movies, in, in my opinion. Halloween Resurrection, though, not so much. <laughs> that one should be thrown in a fire and never talked about. And Halloween H2O was released in 1998, and it brings back the iconic final girl that we all know and love, Laurie Strode, played by, of course, none other than Jamie Lee Curtis. And the basic plot line of it is that Laurie Strode is under some sort of witness protection and has changed her name to Carrie Tate. And she also has a son named John, who is continuously trying to get rid of her fear surrounding the Halloween night. So a little bit different right, from 4, 5, and 6, because, well, Danielle Harris played Jamie Lloyd, right? And that was Laurie Strode's daughter, and Laurie Strode had also died in a car crash. So obviously, with that timeline, it's not going to compute. So I guess in this timeline, she has a son instead of a daughter. And on top of that, there were tons of ideas that were originally tossed around for the seventh Halloween film. One of them was during the pre-production of The Curse of Michael Myers. And they had called the seventh Halloween film at the time, Michael Myers, Lord of the Dead, <laughs> which is fucking ridiculous. The story of it, it would have started immediately after the events of Halloween 6 and focus on Tommy Doyle, oddly enough because apparently Tommy's going to discover that the entire town of Haddonfield was involved in a conspiracy to control Michael Myers. <laughs> so they were, they were still continuing with the whole curse of the thorn bullshit. I don't think they caught the point that nobody fucking gave a shit. And another idea that was pitched after this was Halloween 7, Two Faces of Evil, okay, which was intended to be a direct-to-video film obviously based on the name alone and this take on the franchise would have seen michael myers stalking an all-woman's boarding school and then later in the script it was revealed that it was actually a copycat killer which was compared to the twist from silence of the lambs thankfully <laughs> these ideas were completely thrown to the wayside the original screenplay of Halloween H2O was based on a story by Kevin Williamson, which you may recognize that name from the Screen franchise. And his screenplay was titled Halloween 7, The Revenge of Laurie Strode, which I actually quite dig, to be honest. I, I kind of dig that because it's a take on The Revenge of Michael Myers, but it's The Revenge of Laurie Strode, which H2O kind of is, so I, I dig it, I dig it. The film was also situated as a sequel to the previous six films before it to keep the timeline's continuity. But when Williamson was first putting together the outline for Halloween H2O, the storyline had Laurie Strode faking her own death and taking on a new identity which retcons her character's death from Halloween 4. This also included scenes where a Hillcrest student does a report on the killing spree of Michael Myers. And mentioning the death of Jamie, the previous films going through flashbacks, Laurie would then respond to hearing the report on the death of her daughter by going to the restroom and throwing up. However, that's not the concept, of course, that we ended up getting with Halloween H2O. The final version of the film gives us Dr. Loomis reciting his speech to Sheriff Brackett from the first film when they were inside Michael's childhood home. However, instead of utilizing audio clips from the original Halloween movie, they actually used a sound-alike voice actor, Tom Kane, who provides the voice of Dr. Loomis during the opening credits sequence of Halloween H2O. There was also an attempt at getting the original cast and crew together by Jamie Lee Curtis. This included bringing John Carpenter back in the director's chair. However, despite Carpenter agreeing to direct the film, <laughs> and this is where it gets good, guys, his starting fee as a director 
was $10 million, and he demanded a three-picture deal with Dimension Films. Now, I'm not going to chirp him. First of all, this was denied outright. <laughs> they they straight up denied it, and no deal took place. But we, we all can't really blame Carpenter for wanting $10 million in a three-picture deal. <laughs> like, for one, he is the man behind the franchise. He is the one whose vision you are still banking off of. And the dude only made, what was it again? 20, was it $10,000? He made $10,000 on Halloween 1978. So come on, of course the guy wants 10 million in a three picture deal. You're at movie seven. <laughs> he wants his pay. I don't blame him in the least. And despite the fact he's not directly credited, the writer-producer of Scream, Kevin Williamson, was heavily involved in various areas of the production. He provided a ton of rewrites for character dialogue, along with some alterations to the sketches of the script. He was also the brainchild behind the paramedic storyline, which explains how Michael survives the ending of H2O. During the writing of the plot behind the movie, the writers were hit with a dilemma. Jamie Lee Curtis wanted to end the series completely. However, Mustafa Akkad had a clause that legally wouldn't allow the writers to kill off Michael Myers. So that puts production in a bit of a hot spot, doesn't it? <laughs> so this causes Jamie Lee Curtis to literally almost leave the project just weeks before it started filming. That was until the paramedic storyline was brought up and presented to Akkad. Curtis agreed to be a part of the film at that point, though under the condition that there was nothing that was hinting a sequel of the film. She didn't want any cliffhanger at the end. The audience had to believe that Michael was dead until the inevitable sequel was going to be announced. So filming on the movie got underway on February 18th, 1998, and it concluded on April 20th, 1998. Hillcrest Academy Private School was actually the Canfield Marino Estate in Silver Lake, Los Angeles. Other locations included Melrose Hill, Los Angeles, La Puente, California, and Chatsworth, Los Angeles. The ending of the film took place in Canoga Park in Los Angeles. And until the release of Halloween 2018, Halloween H2O was actually the highest grossing film in the Halloween franchise when it released on August 5th, 1998. The total cost of the movie was $17 million, okay? They got a return of $55,041,738. Absolutely insane return on a horror movie, which doesn't surprise me in the least. It was a great movie. It was the first time that you got to see Michael and Laurie again ever since Halloween 2. So it was definitely a way to get horror fans to come out and be like, Yo, we need to see this. <laughs> so now we're going to dive into the story and the plot of Halloween H2O, and then we're going to talk a whole bunch about how awesome this movie is and why it's such a great Halloween movie. It's 1998 in a remote California town at a secluded private school. We could have a Halloween party just the four of us. We could have a roaming orgy. Oh, the way this man thinks. No booze, no drugs. No kidding. One teacher is living in fear. I'm not who you think I am. I changed my name when I went into hiding. This is terrible. Take off your clothes. My brother killed my sister. <laughs> How'd he do that? With a really big kitchen knife. That's enough. I can't take it, Mom. He's dead. It's been 20 years. What's he waiting for, huh? Don't you think he would have shown up by now? What's going on, baby? I don't know. This is a sick joke. <laughs> now. Come on! The face of good and the face of evil will meet one last time. This time, it's going to be a fight to the finish. Michael! This summer, Terror won't be taking a vacation. Halloween H2O. It's Halloween. I guess everyone is entitled to one good scare. I've had my share. So the cool thing about Halloween H2O is it starts us off with nostalgia right off the bat. <laughs> the first person that we get to see is actually Marion Chambers, 
from the first and second Halloween movie, also a colleague of Dr. Loomis's. We find out that they've been working together in the years previous, and she also took care of him until he died. And the current date is October 29th, 1998. And we're in Loomis's retirement home in Langdon, Illinois. And we notice that the home's been burglarized. Chambers notices that a file on Lori Strode is missing, and then Michael shows up and murders her. The neighbor and his friend then steals a car and heads out to find Lori. We're then brought to Summer Glen, California. We're introduced to Carrie Tate, who is actually Lori Strode. We learn that she faked her death to avoid the murderous rampage of Michael Myers. She's the headmistress of Hillcrest Academy, which is a private boarding school, and is in a relationship with the guidance counselor of the school, Will. Seems like she set herself up for pretty great life after the trauma she experienced, right? Well, maybe not so much. Lori's actually far from happy, and she's still suffering PTSD from the events that occurred in 1978. She lives in constant fear that Michael's going to return for her on Halloween night, so much so that she even passes that same fear onto her son. Speaking of which, the students of Hillcrest Academy are getting ready for a school trip to Yosemite. Lori totally adamant that her son attends and stays safe, especially during Halloween. However, unbeknownst to Lori, her son and some of his friends decide to stay behind at the academy and throw a Halloween party in the basement. And as the movie goes on, weird things begin to happen, right? There's a vehicle parking outside of the gate of the academy with no one appearing to be in sight. Lori also ends up having hallucinations that Michael's coming for her, though she's not entirely wrong. Michael actually has made his way into the academy now and starts beginning a murderous rampage through everyone in sight. During this time, Lori ends up revealing her true identity to Will and explains to him that Michael's coming for her tonight on Halloween. Michael's first victims when he arrives at the school are Charlie and Sarah. Lori's son John and his girlfriend Molly are eventually rescued by both Lori and Will, which is when we get to the most iconic moment in this movie. After 20 years, Lori Strode and Michael Myers are finally face to face again. As they're running through the academy to try and escape Michael, the security guard Ronnie comes down the hallway and is mistaken for Michael Myers. So Will ends up shooting him. And then behind him, Michael lowers himself from the ceiling hiding spot and then murders Will ceremoniously. Lori manages to get John and Molly to safety when she realizes that this will never end. And she will never be safe for Michael Myers as long as he's alive. So she decides she's going to take matters into her own hands and hunt Michael down herself. And it's totally badass as fuck. <laughs> this scene also has one of my favorite moments throughout the entire Halloween franchise. So she gets John and Molly outside the gate of the academy so they can go find some help. She locks them out and stays behind. Then she grabs an axe and starts walking through the academy, yelling, Michael, like calling for him, like, Michael, I'm going to find you. I'm going to hunt you down with this axe and take your head off. Like, it's so badass. And I cannot wait. And I cannot wait for Halloween ends to show us another iteration of badass Lori Strode. Because like that moment for me and then the music hitting right after she says Michael always sends goosebumps down my spine. <laughs> like, it's such an iconic moment. So anyways, Lori finds Michael and stabs him numerous times before pushing him over a balcony. She heads down and then towers over his body, preparing to stab him again. But Ronnie, the security guard, shows up and stops her from doing so. So Ronnie didn't actually die. It wasn't a fatal gunshot wound. Yay, awesome. So police arrive at the scene and they load the body of Michael Myers into a coroner's van. Though this isn't Lori's first rodeo, <laughs> right? She knows how this game works with Michael. So she ends up stealing a gun from one of the officers and then hijacks the coroner's van so she can kill Michael once and for all. <laughs> Badass as fuck, right? So she's driving down the road and Michael rises while he's in the van and attacks Lori. So she slams on the brakes and sends Michael crashing through the windshield. Michael gets back up. So Lori decides she's going to slam the van right into him. <laughs> and they both go tumbling down an embankment. Lori falls out of the van and Michael becomes pinned between the van and a tree. So this puts Michael in a situation where he can't go anywhere. Lori's got him right in her crosshairs. So she stands up, looks at Michael one last time, and he reaches out his hand towards her. In a moment that almost feels like it's a brother reaching out to the sister being like, I'm sorry, you know, give me another chance. So a look of pity quickly crosses Lori Strode's face and then she raises the axe and decapitates Michael to end the movie. <laughs> oh, man. Great ending, though. Like, I loved the ending. When I first saw Halloween H20, I, I, I loved that ending. Honestly, I won't lie. They had me. <laughs> like, they absolutely had me when this movie came out. 
I actually thought like Michael was done for good. And I know, I know you can never say never when it comes to horror, <laughs> though I had no idea how they could come back from chopping off Michael's head. Obviously, we, we know it was a ruse for those who have seen Resurrection, which we'll get into shortly. Though, for those who had watched it before Resurrection came out, this was a pretty definitive moment for many that Michael may have actually have finally been killed by none other than Laurie Strode. Had they chose to actually end the franchise with H2O, I feel it still would have been an excellent ending, giving Laurie that final ending and that closure of killing Michael Myers and finally being able to live her life without having to worry about looking over her shoulder for Michael. Some fun facts about this movie. You can tell that uh, Williamson had a big hand in some of these scenes just by the meta horror that tickles my fancy. Like, there is so much meta horror throughout all of Halloween H20. There really is. But we're going to go over some of the real key points that kind of popped out to me. So first off, at the beginning of the movie, we see Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character hop into the frame while wearing a very familiar mask to horror fans. It's a hockey mask, which is actually very reminiscent of the mask that was worn by Jason Voorhees, which is an obvious nod to the Friday the 13th series. There's also a small cameo by a very famous horror actress, which can be easily missed by most people. In the scene where Laurie is standing near the gates of the school, we get to meet her secretary, Norma Watson. You may remember this if you've seen H2O. This scene gave us a bunch of meta horror moments in a span of like 30 to 45 seconds, so you've got to like be eagle-eyed to catch all of them. So the actress who plays Laurie's secretary is actually none other than her mother, Janet Lee. Now, for those who don't know, she was the lead role in Psycho and the Scream Queen in the infamous shower scene. The name of her character, Norma Watson, so the name of the secretary in H2O, is actually a nod to PJ Souls. She was the actress that played Linda in Halloween 1978. But the name Norma Watson was the character that PJ Souls had portrayed in the horror movie Carrie. So we're getting a callback to an actress from Halloween 1978 and a callback to one of her roles in a different horror movie. But that's not all. There's still more meta horror found within this one scene, which is absolutely insane. So the car that Norma drives in Halloween H2O is the exact same model and color as the one that she drove in Psycho. It's a 1957 Ford sedan with also the same registration plate of NFB 418, which is obviously a huge callback not only to Psycho, but to Alfred Hitchcock himself. And it doesn't end there with Williamson as well. Oh, no, 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 no. There's even more connections between this movie and the Scream franchise specifically. So first of all, the actor who plays Michael Myers in Halloween H2O, it's the same actor who donned the ghost face mask in Scream 2, which is also a film that Williamson was working on. And then there's also another scene where Laurie's telling her son and the girlfriend to go next door and find help at the Becker's house. This is a direct callback to the opening scene of Scream, where Casey Becker, who was played by Drew Barrymore, is killed, and her father tells his wife to go down to the street to the Mackenzie's house. This quote from Scream is a direct reference, of course, to the original movie, uh, the original Halloween movie in 1978. So the weaving and tie-ins between Halloween and Scream obviously go super deep in this movie. It's definitely a great Easter egg for fans of both franchises to enjoy. And the thing is, too, is that for most horror fans, if they're going to name a favorite classic movie, they're mostly going to say Scream and Halloween. And if they're going to talk about the Halloween franchise, they're always going to say that the original 1978 film's the best one, right? Like, that's what we're always going to say. 1978 is the absolute best movie. There's, there's no question about it. And Halloween H2O being a direct sequel to Halloween 1 and 2 is one of the reasons why it works so well. Because Laurie Strode is still the final girl right we get to see her evolve we get to see her now 20 years later as an adult with a family how did that night impact her now as an adult right and we get to see that ptsd and that trauma that really engulfed her life michael myers is always going to scare people no matter how many times he shows up in movies and it really didn't disappoint as well when it came to age 2 he continues to go after each of his victims with no remorse nothing at all and the movie also functions as a great teen horror movie and i feel like it's really underrated like in general like not just as one of the halloween movies but as a horror movie i feel like it's really underrated and it's a good entry into the halloween franchise i feel like for teenagers who want to get into it but they don't want to watch the the slow buildup of Halloween 1978. They want to watch something a little bit more fast paced. Halloween H2O is a great entry point into the franchise for that because it gives you that story. It gives you that lore, makes them interested in wanting to watch the movies beforehand, but it gives you enough action and fast paced so that they fall in love with Michael like you did 
when you first watched it. Halloween H2O just feels like it gives Lori the strong storyline that she deserves. Like in Halloween Kills, right, Lori's fighting back against Michael, which is great to see, of course, but she spends the majority of the film in the hospital, and fans don't really get to, to see enough of her kind of being that badass character that we know her to be. But in Halloween H2O, Lori's decided the kind of life that she wants to live, and that's worth celebrating. Even if many fans, you know, don't love this movie, it's possible to enjoy the film just acknowledging the fact that nothing's going to compare to the first film, right? Like, I understand a lot of people wanted certain things, they wanted the character to be a certain way based on how she was in Halloween 1 and 2, but there's an evolution to characters, right? And there's an evolution in society and what they will expect from a horror movie and what they'll even accept from a horror movie at the same time. You've got to please everybody, which is really the challenge when you're putting together not only just any horror movie, but an entry in an iconic franchise like Halloween. And it was also interesting in H2O to see Laurie's decision of playing dead and then go by a new name actually come back to haunt her. And that was something that she knew was going to happen, obviously, eventually. But it's interesting to see that play out and see how that will impact her life at that point. And the thing that sucks about Halloween H2O, well, not really that sucks about Halloween H2O, I should say sucks about Halloween Resurrection, is the fact that we were excited for a new story for Laurie Strode right? Especially when Halloween Resurrection got announced and her face was on the poster and we're like, oh, oh, there's going to be more Laurie Strode. Amazing, amazing. But then we were sorely disappointed, of course, which is what we're going to head into right now. Oh, just like Season of the Witch, we're about to talk about one of my most absolute hated Halloween movies. And this is the one that I deem to be the worst Halloween movie ever period, end of sentence. Halloween Resurrection didn't need to be made. It was literally a cash grab. And at the same time, pissed off every fucking Michael Myers fan. I feel like, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I don't know how mad you guys were with Resurrection, but I was pissed. Like, I was fucking livid about Resurrection. Now, anyways, let's talk about Halloween Resurrection, all right? It doesn't matter that I've been absolutely dreading talking about Halloween Resurrection. Uh, the film, it really felt like they were just trying to take Halloween in the anthology route finally. Like, that's really what I took away from Resurrection, because there's no actual story, there's no connecting pieces, it's just literally Michael slaughtering his way through countless bodies. Like, it doesn't sound bad though, right? <laughs> like, at the end of the day, if I was like, hey, you want to watch a Michael Myers movie of him just slashing through everybody in sight, many people would be like, well, yeah, sure. But believe it or not, this one was actually very poorly executed. If you haven't seen Halloween Resurrection, awesome, great. I encourage you not to. <laughs> like, I truly encourage you not to watch this movie. But if you haven't, and then you're listening to this and it interests you to watch it just because it's so bad, <laughs> then do it in that case. Do it, do it going in with super low expectations and expecting a bad movie, and you should be good to go. Now, the first thing I want to briefly touch on is the mask. This is what makes Michael so iconic, right? Outside of the actor's frame and the bland, dark, colored one-piece outfit that Michael wears, the mask is what makes Michael. That is what you want to see. Anybody can put on the outfit and ask what they are. Some people may get it, some may not. But you put on that mask, <laughs> and everyone knows you're Michael Myers. So the biggest piece for me when it comes to the mask for this movie was his eyes, right? If you go back to Halloween 1978... And one of the most iconic lines that is still repeated to this day by Sam Loomis is he had the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. So why am I seeing white in his eyes during this movie? Someone please fucking explain to me why I'm seeing white and skin and not just pure blackness in his fucking eyes. I don't care if you've got a CGI it. You could make his eyes black. That's, that's number one to me. That's like numero uno. When it comes to Michael Myers, he, he has the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I don't... <laughs> I, anyways, that really took me out of the movie immediately. When I first saw Michael Myers in, in Halloween Resurrection, immediately I knew it was going to be a bad movie. Because I'm like, you can't even get that small detail. That's one of the most important details about the character, right? Ay, 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 what, are, what the fuck are we in for now at this point? So, And to be completely honest with you, the first time that I watched Halloween Resurrection... I was expecting the entire time that the ending was going to be a twist and would actually reveal a copycat killer and the real Michael Myers would end up showing up at the end and killing this imposter. That's what I was expecting throughout the whole movie because I'm like, there's no way this is really Michael Myers. There's no way they're fucking it up this bad. They're going to 
retcon it by the end of the movie and give us the real one. Nope. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. And I got a funny story, actually, to tell you guys about this movie and about my personal experience when I first saw it. So I obviously wanted to see this movie so bad when it was released in theaters, but I was only 13 at the time when it was released and of course it was rated r which means you had to be at least 18 to watch it you couldn't even be accompanied by an adult nothing my mom tried to to do this and it didn't work she actually snuck me in to the movie theater i bought a ticket to lilo and stitch <laughs> and then i snuck into halloween with my mom <laughs> to watch halloween resurrection unfortunately though i got caught not long before the movie started and I had to actually sit and watch uh, Lilo and Stitch, <laughs> which is unfortunate, you know, for a 13 year old who went to the movie theaters expecting to watch Halloween. Now you got to watch Lilo and Stitch. However, I'm happy because it spared me from having to sit through this terrible movie in a movie theater. <laughs> Halloween Resurrection was released in 2002 and Rick Rosenthal sat in the director's chair who had also been the director for Halloween 2. Larry Brand and Sean Hood both worked on devising the screenplay together, and the film was meant to be a direct sequel to Halloween H2O. Jamie Lee Curtis, she does come back for this one, albeit brief. <laughs> she, she does reprise her role as Laurie Strode, and Brad Laurie plays Michael Myers. There's also some new additions to the cast in this movie, as there generally is in every Halloween movie. We actually got some big names, though, in this Halloween. We had Sean Patrick Thomas, Tyra Banks, and... Uh, Busta Rhymes play starring roles in Halloween Resurrection. I, I say Busta Rhymes hesitantly because, man, that dude just made this movie into something it shouldn't have been, but we'll get into that. We'll get into that. Principal photography of the film got underway on May 14th, 2001 in Vancouver, British Columbia. The scenes at the beginning of the film, where you see Laurie Strode in a hospital, were filmed at Riverview Hospital in Coquitlam, BC, which ironically ties us back to our, uh, our Grave Encounters episode because that was actually the same hospital where they filmed Grave Encounters 1 and 2. So that's actually a pretty cool connection between Grave Encounters and Halloween, is the fact that Halloween Resurrection filmed scenes in the same hospital that Grave Encounters did. So that's pretty cool. And Halloween Resurrection, it actually didn't start as Halloween Resurrection. It underwent many name changes. Everything from Halloween Homecoming, I'd heard that one, I heard that one before Resurrection, to Halloween H2K, get <laughs> like y2k but h2k and then they even had one that was halloween michaelmyers.com <laughs> which which probably would have been an appropriate campy crappy name for how bad this movie is so i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't necessarily have been so upset about it later on in life <laughs> the producers though they finally landed on a title that they wanted and it was one that let the audience know that michael myers was still alive that's what they wanted to let everybody know at the end of the day right because it's a fair guess considering most people probably believed michael was decapitated at the end of halloween h2o and it's also possible that many people would have suspected that they were actually pulling another season of The Witch on everyone and doing a Halloween without Michael Myers, right? Like, it's been done once, why wouldn't it be done again? So they probably wanted to make it clear to everyone that, hey, don't worry, Michael's still alive, Michael's coming back, we'll tell you how. So that played well on them because the movie, when it was released on July 12, 2002, it ended up making $3,354,442 domestically, $7,310,413 internationally, which brought them to a worldwide gross of $37,664,855, which isn't that bad for a horror movie at the time. Can't really complain, can't really complain. Now, I have a lot to say about this movie. <laughs> so let's dive into the plot first and get this dumpster fire over with, and then we can get to the nitty gritty of why this movie is so fucking shit. Tomorrow night, you will enter the childhood home of our most brutal mass murderer. The home has been rigged up with several cameras, but for the most part, the audience will see only what you see. Six friends. Are you sure they're not just putting us in some house with hidden cameras in the shower? This is gonna be fun. Have been offered fame and fortune. That's the American dream. All they need to do... All the windows will be boarded up and all the doors will be locked shut behind them. No one will be allowed to leave until the show is over. You stay the night. Let the danger tainment begin. Now... You think this is the one that he used to, you know, do his thing? The webcast is live. One flash and you could light up a thousand computer screens. You are like this close to getting voted off the island. The stage 
is set. Has anybody else seen this? That worked perfect. Whoa! It's all fake. We've been set up. Only trying to give America a good show. But the house. Wait, what just happened? We just lost Bill's camera. There's somebody in the hall. Is his. Summer. How many plants help us? Evil <laughs> comes home. Trick or treat, mother. Want a piece of me? Hello, Michael. I knew you'd come sooner or later. What took you so long? So the movie opens with a guilt-ridden, traumatized Laurie Strode. She's been confined to a psychiatric facility following the events that occurred at Hillcrest Academy. It turns out that she had actually murdered an innocent man. Two nurses are seen talking, and then we witness a flashback to Halloween H2O. This is where we see Michael Myers unconscious laying in the school when Laurie Strode had pushed him off the balcony. But he suddenly awakens and ends up attacking one of the paramedics, crushes the larynx of the paramedic, and makes him unable to speak. He then swaps outfits with him, so the paramedic becomes Michael Myers, and Michael then escapes out in the woods behind the school as Laurie drove off in the ambulance with the person she believed was Michael. Pretty creative twist, right? Like, at the end of the day, regardless of how bad this movie was, it was a decently creative twist, because it was a way that they brought Michael Myers back to life that hadn't been done before. Like, a lot of the times before, it was always supernatural-related. There was always some sort of supernatural reason why Michael was still alive, which is cool. There's, I'm not bashing that. But it was also great to see another method to Michael's madness in keeping himself alive and avoiding death once again by tr literally trading places with a paramedic. Genius. I really enjoyed that part of the movie. We then fast forward to Halloween night 2001. It's three years later from that night at Hillcrest. And out of nowhere, Michael all of a sudden reemerges. We have no idea why. There's no rhyme or reason as to why it took him three years to come back for Lori. None whatsoever. It's not like he was injured or blown up. Like, he got stabbed a bunch, yeah, but it's not going to take you three years to recover from that. But anyways, I digress. I digress. So Lori's in the hospital, and she's been expecting Michael's arrival for years now. And then he finally shows up, and she's got a trap already set for him, which is pretty cool, right? Michael, of course, ends up killing some security guards breaking into the hospital, and then ends up chasing Lori to the rooftop of the hospital building. He walks right into Lori's trap, and he ends up hanging himself off of the edge of the building by his foot. Now, Lori Strode finally has the opportunity to kill Michael once and for all. She wants to kill Michael. I get that. I get the fact that, she, you know, she decapitated a man that she truly believed was Michael. So this time she had to make sure 100% that she was actually killing the real Michael. So she decides to reach for his mask and take it off. Logically, that makes sense. However, when did she ever actually see Michael's face in a good light? Like, how would she even know for sure if it was Michael Myers. There would be no way. Taking the mask off in the end wouldn't have helped her anyways. It, it, it wouldn't have done anything. But I digress. I digress. I'm tearing this movie apart in the plot, guys. I just, I can't help it. Obviously, Michael was ready for her and grabbed Lori towards him and stabs her in the chest. They have this somewhat weird moment of goodbye together, and he lets her go and drops her from the rooftop onto the ground below. Lori Strode dies. That's the death of Laurie Strode. Guys, I gotta say, when I first saw this, I was so pissed. I was literally yelling at my TV, like, how the fuck can you kill off Laurie Strode like that? Like, I get that in the end, you know, your favorite characters might die, which we, which we could see in Halloween Ends. It's, it's totally possible. Though, she deserves to die with honor. Not 15 minutes into the movie, 
And literally, this spelled disaster for me for the rest of the movie. Like, I was kind of hoping borderline that Laurie wasn't dead and she was going to come back at the end of the movie and actually kill Michael. Yeah, just like my uh, copycat killer kind of deal in this movie, that didn't happen either. Like, all the things they could have done to make this movie good and make up for the beginning of it, they didn't do. And it just got worse from here. Oh, so the movie does a, uh, a second time jump because we apparently need to get as far away from 1998 as possible. This time jump is a year later, so a year after the death of Laurie Strode. We end up seeing college students Sarah, Bill, Donna, Jen, Jim, and Rudy, and they've all won a competition to appear on an internet reality show called Dangertainment, which is directed by Freddie Harris and Nora Winston, who are Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks. And the deal is that these students have to spend a night in the abandoned childhood home of Michael Myers and then figure out what led him to kill, what, how he became a serial killer, that kind of thing. Interesting concept, no doubt, right? Like, this was at the hype and the craze of, you know, internet and reality TV shows, so kind of a cool concept. The crew ends up showing up at the house to begin preparing, setting up for the show, when the cameraman realizes he's not alone. Michael ends up killing him inside the house. We're then brought to Halloween night. And the students are all locked in the house and they get equipped with head cameras so that viewers can watch everything they're doing in real time online. Pretty much this was one of the first types of live streaming, I guess you could say. They separate into three different groups and start searching for clues around the house as to what caused Michael Myers to start killing. One of Sarah's friends, Miles, ends up watching the live broadcast and starts messaging her as he's watching it in real time. During this time, Michael appears in the house and ends up murdering Bill. Donna and Jim find a wall, which was filled top to bottom with fake corpses. Yeah. And then you realize that on top of all this madness that's going on, and you know as the audience, right? You know Michael's in the house. You find out at the same time that the producers had actually set everything up and that this whole thing was staged. However, Michael shows up and ends up killing Jim while Sarah's friend Miles witnesses the murder on the live stream, though he's the only one who believes that what's actually occurring is real. On the flip side, we get to see Freddy, who is played by Busta Rhymes, dressed up as a copycat Michael Myers. (laughs) Oh boy, so remember, right? This whole thing was apparently supposed to be staged, and no one was banking on Mikey actually showing up to the party. So Freddy's entering the house, he's dressed up as Michael, and then he's followed around the house by the real Michael Myers, who he believes is actually Charlie in a mask. So yeah, we can all see where this is going. Rudy, Sarah, and Jim end up finding Freddy in the Michael costume, who then reveals to them that this was all a scheme from the start and then begs them to cooperate with him so that they can get a big payday at the end of it. Freddy then leaves, and the three of them go to gather everyone else together to get the fuck out of the house when Jen discovers Bill's corpse and ends up getting decapitated right in front of the remaining students. At first, they thought it was Freddy, but soon they realize the real Michael Myers is also staying the night with them. So he then proceeds to kill Jim and Rudy before chasing Sarah up the stairs. She locks herself in a bedroom, begins to beg her friend to help who's watching from the other cameras placed around the house, and she begins to receive messages on where Michael is throughout the house, as other people begin to realize that, well, these murders are actually real. Sarah then finds Freddy, just as Michael shows up and stabs him. So she ends up running into tunnels and finds an exit, which leads to the garage. Michael shows up and attacks Sarah, though Freddy is still alive and ends up fighting Michael in one of the most ridiculous scenes ever to take place in a horror movie. Who gave Buster Rhymes permission to dropkick Michael Myers? Fired. (laughs) Anyways, the ensuing fight ends up starting an electrical fire in the garage, which also electrocutes Michael. Freddy brings Sarah to safety, where they're interviewed by local news reporters. Meanwhile, Michael's presumed dead from both the electrocution and the fire. Yet, his body's taken to the morgue, the coroner prepares to examine his body, and he suddenly opens his eyes, because we know Michael never dies. (laughs) Ay, 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 see what I mean, guys? Even explaining the plot to you all, I can't make it exciting or even justify it being good in any way it's absolute trash not to mention way to set off an entire fan base by killing off laurie strode 15 minutes into the movie like i said before i was honestly sitting and waiting the entire time for her to make some kind of comeback and just kill michael in the end but nope just more bullshit apparently though the decision to kill off laurie strode was actually there long before resurrection was even written this is because jamie lee curtis actually asked for her character to return and be killed off. So she was done at the time, 
with the Halloween franchise. And I say at the time because we all know where we're at today. <laughs> and she seems to very much be enjoying the role and the closure that she's able to bring to it now. And the biggest challenge I feel that the crew faced with producing this movie was taking the risk of killing Laurie Strode so early on in the film while making the audience still feel invested despite this death of a great, grand, legendary character in the in the series. They tried by somewhat bringing back that origin of evil with Michael Myers, though the execution fell completely flat. It just, it felt like they were trying to capitalize on the technological boom of the 2000s during a time when it was all still new, and it was in its infancy. It wasn't something the majority of society could yet connect to because it still wasn't familiar to them yet. Having Michael just go after random fodder who make the mistake of entering his childhood home, it sounds like something from the Halloween young adult novels. Like, the plot itself was just a complete cop-out and not something that actually gave anything to the franchise. It was just another money grab and maybe even a chance to turn Michael Myers into that anthology series that they originally wanted to and just have Michael killing random fucking teenagers every every Halloween <laughs> with with no connection between the movies. Like, who knows? Either way, it was a commercial disaster. But, 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 then we get Halloween 2018 and Halloween Kills, which is going to be what we're going to talk about on next week's episode of the podcast, along with Halloween Ends, hopefully, hopefully. Now, I'm in Canada, guys, and not only am I in Canada, but I live in, like, the middle of nowhere. I, I'm in a small town. I don't have any big cities close to me, which means I don't have any movie theaters nearby. Like, the closest one is, like, an hour's drive away, and I also don't drive. So, I'm really relying on the fact that I can use a VPN to access Peacock so I can watch it. So, hopefully... And I can't wait to get back with you guys next week. If you're looking for daily horror content, you know where to find me. I'm always on Instagram and Facebook, Cabin of Horrors Podcast. Come give me a follow. Come drop a line. Say hi. And you can also leave voice messages for me now. You can leave me voice messages that I can use in the podcast and answer your questions. So feel free to leave me a voice message at any time. And also rate my podcast, please. If your podcast platform gives the ability to rate or review my podcast, I would absolutely love if you just took a moment out of your day to rate or review my podcast. So hopefully it can be seen by more people. And I hope you guys enjoyed part three of the Halloween franchise review. And I'll see you in the shadows.